I've talked multiple times on this channel about RPG Maker and why I love it so much. The community, one-of-a-kind games, and fan games they inspire. There's such a huge variety of games you can make, because at the end of the day, it's just an engine, and what you choose to do with that engine is up to you. Do you use the limitations to your advantage, or do you find clever workarounds? Sometimes I play an RPG Maker game and I'm left in awe of what some developers can accomplish. Today, I'm showing you five completely different RPG Maker games that I found in my recent deep dive. Parasite Cycle is a 1-bit adventure game by Cuddlefresh, where you play as a parasite. The opening of the demo describes your role. A parasite is what you are, what you have been, what you will be. You're dreaming of a beach when the image of a girl begins to come into focus. It's interrupted by a group of faceless individuals called the Shareholders. They inform you that you've been chosen to enter the town of Ichishima to eliminate enemy parasites. They even supply a body for you to control, that of Kubo Kiseko. Then, you wake up. While the premise of the game is vague at best, the concept is actually fairly simple. Your job as the parasite within Kubo is to search the town for any other parasites that are encroaching on the shareholders. While the full game promises to have multiple locations to visit, the demo only includes Kubo's school. The gameplay is your typical RPG Maker affair. You explore the level, find notes and hints for puzzles, items that help you advance, things like that. Where Parasite Cycle really stands out though is in its art. The black and white one-bit style of the sprites give it a very classic feel. It often feels like it's closer to Corpse Party 98 than any other RPG Maker game. But then you get the full character portraits, and you can see the full extent of the detail. It has a very similar vibe to World of Horror, a game that I previously covered and very much appreciate. There's only one other parasite in the demo, and its location and design is very interesting. If I had to give any negatives, I'd say that the demo is quite rough. For some reason, there's this black square that covers the bottom left of the screen at all times, and while it's only noticeable in certain rooms, it's still a little annoying. Also, I managed to run into a glitch after reaching the final puzzle of the demo that removes your ability to open the menu, so make sure you save before you interact with any pianos. All that aside, I'm really excited to see where the full game goes and find out just how many parasites are lurking in Ichishima. Continuing on the trend of somewhat traditional RPG Maker games, Symbiosis begins in a way that many RPG Maker fans will be familiar with, a house in the woods that is said to be owned by a witch. The witch's house is described as arrogant, mighty, and wretched, and visitors to the forest have a tendency to go missing. When the game begins, you're controlling a woman named Patricia, being chased by what she calls an old hag. Once you find a hiding spot, you realise that it's all in vain, as the witch swiftly finds her. Here is where we get our unique spin, as control shifts to the supposed witch, a woman named Magnolia. While propping the now dead intruder on a table, she hears the sounds of a walkie-talkie coming from their pockets. Realising that this woman was more than just a regular lost tourist, she regrets killing her so quickly, and decides to hunt down the rest of her party. Upon leaving her basement, she finds her son Mint is still awake, and realises he's in danger as long as intruders were in the house. She hurries the boy to bed, and reads him the story of the tree of little pigs to help him sleep. Happy that her son would be safe in his room, Magnolia begins exploring every part of the house to find any intruders, and discover what they want with her. This is your gameplay loop. Explore the house, find an intruder, dispose of them, and continue. Each intruder offers you a little more insight into Magnolia, why she lives deep in the woods, and what these people want with her. If you haven't realised it yet, Magnolia is not a traditional witch. In fact, she's not even a witch at all. However, that doesn't mean that she's completely clean. After all, the first thing we see her do is murder someone in cold blood. Magnolia is a very interesting spin on the concept of a witch, because while she is an older woman living deep in the woods and kidnapping anyone who comes near, she's not cooking them in cauldrons or taking their energy so she can live forever. I won't spoil anything, but I will say that her story is very interesting, and she's almost sympathetic even when you consider all the murder. The crux of the narrative revolves around her relationship with Mint 
her son. If you explore the house with him and check all of the different objects in the living room, you get a very good idea of their living situation. Magnolia homeschools Mint, and is extremely protective of him, not allowing him to go outside during the day or play with other children from the nearby village, for fear of what might happen to him. Magnolia clearly loves him, and some of her dialogue shows that beneath her terrifying actions is the heart of a mother. Despite the intro's implication of her as a horrid woman living with her creations, she seems to be brimming with affection for her son. I won't say much more. This one is especially short, only about 30 minutes if you're really thorough with your investigation, but there are two endings depending on a choice you make early on. Symbiosis is an interesting spin on a familiar RPG Maker setup. Labyrinth Derelict Abyss is one of my favourite genres of RPG Maker games, the kind where you walk into a room and are met with bizarre and beautiful imagery all at once. The game begins with two lines of dialogue, you are fully formed, do what you must. You're then dropped straight into the world with a tutorial and are expected to just explore. Your character doesn't have a name. It is a white mask with a red swirl painted on the front, floating on top of a green cloak. Eventually, after stumbling around for a while, you'll find a gate that tells you to collect all 12 relics to unlock it. This is your goal. If I had to describe it in its most basic form, Labyrinth is like a much more finite Yume Niki. Rather than exploring huge looping levels that go on endlessly, each area in Labyrinth is relatively easy to navigate. There are fast travel points that make finding each of the different locations much easier, and rather than being expected to stumble upon the relics, the game features a hint machine that points you in the right direction. Each relic is found in different corners of the map. Sometimes they're as simple as following the path in front of you, while other times you have to get a bit more creative. They each come in different forms. Some are hearts, others are animals, and some are less easy to describe. Each time you find a relic, you get a short conversation with them, although some are more useful than others. One of the first relics I found was a yellow book, named Pamphor the Lymph Scholar, arguably the only relic that offers any sort of insight into the world around you. She explains that she created the labyrinth, and summoned you in order to help them. The relic are trapped and have no way to escape, so your job is to free all of them. While some of the other relics are happy to see you, others are less than excited about Pamphor's newest scheme. On your journey, you might even discover other people that have met dark ends, or failed to do what you have done. Exploring the labyrinth is incredibly fun. There are about four unique areas, and each of those are filled with secrets and passageways that connect to each other. If I had to give you some advice, I would say don't use the hint machine until you're sure you've explored most of the areas. You can you can get at least 8 of the relics by just checking each major path, and only after you find yourself walking down the same hallways should you need to get a hint. Some of these areas have some of the coolest background art I've seen in an RPG Maker game, and a lot of the secrets were fun to find, which made exploring feel extremely rewarding. I don't want to show off everything this game has to offer, so I'll leave it at that. A meditative game filled with bizarre imagery, Labyrinth Derelict Abyss is a short, creepy exploration game that leads up to some incredibly cool moments. Flesh, Blood, and Concrete is a complicated game. You play as a woman named Lyra, who finds her car drifting off course while driving through the snow and ice of Russia. She wakes up in a place that she describes as both alien and intimate, interchangeable with the town she grew up in. After a brief flashback to her childhood, Lyra exits her car to look for a petrol station, but finds only tall apartment buildings, all grey and indistinguishable from each other. Out in the snow, she sees a young girl in an old school uniform building a snowman, but she runs into a nearby building when she sees Lyra. Since the building has lights on, Lyra decides to enter and see if she can find help. Most of the game takes place in this apartment building, as Lyra searches each of the rooms for any signs of life. Along the way, she runs into the girl from outside, and eventually finds out her name is Nika. She says she lives in the building with her family, although Lyra is yet to see anyone else. There aren't any puzzles to solve. Instead, the game focuses on exploration and conversations. The building is filled to the brim with items for you to pick up, each one giving you a little bit of insight into Lyra's past and thoughts. It can be anything from food, to old foreign coins, or 60s Soviet paraphernalia. While the building is creepy, a lot of Lyra's flavor text is actually pretty funny such as the precious cup, 
which she describes as not for drinking out of, but for keeping in a display case so that spiders can nest in it. There are a few unique items too, such as the tapes that you can actually play in one of the rooms. Some of them are old cartoons, while others, such as the home videos, are much harder to describe. These items aren't just flavor text though, as once you hit the second half of the story, some of them unlock new conversations between Lyra and Nika. As you've probably guessed, there's something sinister about this apartment building. Lyra mentions how some of the rooms remind her of her grandmother's house, and the different items all seem to relate to her past somehow. There's a melancholic nostalgia that fills the halls. She describes how certain objects feel as though they've been snatched out of her memory. The further you ascend the flights of stairs, the more sinister the rooms become. The title of the game is accurate. The building isn't just made of concrete, it's alive. Some of the walls are coated in muscle and sinew, and seem to be digesting organic material around it. At some point, as if the building is done with its facade, the hallways begin to shift and form into a nightmarish world, twisting her memories and presenting them back to her, along with some incredibly interesting effects. There are two endings to the game, all hinging on a choice you make right at the end, and both are very different. There are tons of complex themes and things to discuss about this game, from post-USSR Russia, to childhood trauma, and a number of other content warnings that I would recommend reading before you start the game. If you need any help playing it, or if you just want more insight into it, you can check out the creator's website where they have a walkthrough and some supplementary material. Flesh, Blood, and Concrete is a slow burn horror game that doesn't let up. I've never covered a game like An Outcry in this series before. Before we get into it, I have to say that this game touches on a wide range of very tough topics, and if you plan on playing it, I would really recommend checking the content warning before committing to buying it. An Outcry was made in RPG Maker 2003, but you wouldn't be able to guess that if it weren't for the typical Kadokawa logo that appears on launch. You control a non-binary protagonist that is simply referred to as the unnamed, and I use the word control very deliberately. The game begins with a narrator passing the unnamed to you, and all of their actions are described in third person. They live in an apartment building in Vienna in 2017, and the entire game takes place within this relatively small location. One night, the unnamed leaves for their post downstairs, only to discover that they left their keys, cigarettes, and lighter in their apartment. Now locked out and with nowhere to turn to, the unnamed relies on the kindness of their neighbors to help them through the long night. Unfortunately, things aren't as easy as that. There are four neighbors on the unnamed's floor, the bigoted Mr. Schmidt, the elderly and equally bigoted Mrs. Eisen, the single mother and cleaning lady Mrs. Yildirim, and the unnamed seemingly only friend, Anne Piero. While exploring the building and talking to each of the characters, it becomes clear that the unnamed, and many others around them, deal with a lot of bigotry in their day-to-day -day life. When you eventually guide the unnamed to their post, you discover their package has been tossed into the street, and this is where we get our first view of Austria. A political poster informs us that tonight is the night before an election, with a horrific smile plastered on the politician's face. Eventually, after receiving a lighter from Anne and some cigarettes from one of their neighbors, the unnamed enters the courtyard of their building and watches as the plume of smoke is carried into the night sky. Suddenly, a noise snaps them back to reality, a distant outcry. From here, the game offers you a choice. Do you follow the noise, or ignore it? Each of these choices lead to two drastically different routes, each with an entirely different focus. An Outcry is an RPG Maker horror game with emphasis on the RPG. The game has a full combat system, and while there isn't any leveling or XP, one of the routes has a pretty steady flow of encounters for you to fight. Since the game doesn't have any progression, the actual combat is quite simple. You can attack, buff defense and speed, heal, regain SP, check the enemy, and run away. All of the combat encounters allow you to run away if you survive a few turns, but none of the regular fights are unwinnable. While there are only minor benefits to beating them, I found that as long as you use plan ahead to speed up your skills and spam brace to increase your defense, you should be able to deal with any enemies pretty easily. But like I said, only one of the routes expects you to use this combat system regularly, so it doesn't need to be overly complex or challenging. Between the two routes, the game took me about four hours to beat, and it's also rare for being one of the few games I've talked about in one of these videos that actually has a decent price tag. The second I finished An Outcry, I 
I just knew I had to talk about it. It's a deeply sad game, one where people are seen as less than human, and forced to debate their own existence. I wish I could say that the story of this game was exaggerated or over the top, but without getting too real here, Europe isn't exactly in the greatest spot right now. Beyond the modern isms that the story touches on, it also speaks about heavy historical events and their implications. How do you assess your ancestors who did nothing, or even abetted the Nazis during World War II, is a conversation that occurs on one of the roots. The primary antagonists on both roots are birds that speak in riddles. While their dialogue can be complex, their intentions are very clear, protecting birdness and crushing anything outside of it. It is an affront to us that nameless things remain to breathe. Depending on the route, your conversations with the birds will change, and each one tells a horrifying story, but not one without hope. This is all without even mentioning the fantastic music, which ranges from atmospheric and discordant to heartbreaking and beautiful. An Outcry is an extremely special game, one that I didn't expect to affect me as much as it did. It's a game about choosing defiance and rejecting silence, one that shows there's always another option as long as you're willing to stand up for it. It's an important game that deserves so much more attention, and I hope it manages to touch you in a way that it touched me. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video. As always, all the games I discussed are in the description, and I'd highly recommend you check them out. My socials and tip jar are also available as always, and if you want to see more videos like this, then please let me know. I'm currently working on some videos for October that I'm excited for you all to see, so please hit subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you real soon.